This is an episode of the Anxiety Rx podcast I've wanted to do for a long time, but I've kind of shied away from it, which is basically what are the medications that we use for anxiety? Now, I'm not a huge fan of medication for anxiety because I think it blunts the underlying need to actually expose the old pain, but I also know that that old pain can be so devastating for so many people that we need medication. And I'm not against medication. I I think that medication is very helpful and, in fact, life-saving. I've observed the life-saving effects of antidepressant medication and anxiety medication in my own patients. I was a doctor for 22 years. I used them extensively. And in my opinion, they were justified at the time. Now, are they overprescribed? Yes. Yes. And I think the big reason for why medications are overprescribed is because doctors aren't trained in emotional, specifically childhood wounding. It's funny and ironic because a lot of what we see as medical doctors, mental, physical, emotional pain and suffering had much to do with childhood wounding. But we don't understand anything about, nor are we trained in childhood wounding. Back in 1997, when the Adverse Childhood Events Study came out, the ACE study, it was all the rage for a little while in medicine. And by 2005, it started to slip a little bit. And the reason why I think medical doctors don't lean on the ACE study very much is that we can't do much about it. If I have seven to 10 minutes with a patient and I know they've been physically, emotionally, sexually abused, there's not much I can do with that as a doctor. A, I'm not trained in it. I'm not trained in trauma. I'm not trained in how to help patients resolve their trauma. And I don't have the time. So we have these patients who are presenting with these very strange presentations of illness. And I make a joke. I used to have a joke on stage, you know, about, you know, sometimes my patients will come up and say, you know, my my teeth are itchy and it burns behind my eyes when I pee, you know, which is a joke. But whenever I see a patient that's got a really strange presentation that doesn't fit the normal pattern of, say, a gallbladder issue or a heart issue or whatever. I always think childhood trauma, and I tell my colleagues that too, because medications are kind of how we're trained as doctors. We're trained to modify symptoms with medications. We don't actually heal the issue, unless we're talking about antibiotics, in which case we often heal the issue. But in general, our medications don't heal you, they just help you cope. They just help you deal with the underlying pain that you're going through. So I wanted to talk a little bit about you know anxiety medications and what we often use as doctors and what we often overuse as doctors, maybe why we use them. And if you've been on medication, you will definitely hear some of the ones that I'm talking about. So the first one we talk about as far as in no particular order, as they say at the Academy Awards. The first one I'll talk about is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the so-called SSRIs. Now, they're a very popular group of medications because they do seem to have some real benefits in anxiety and also in OCD. But they come at a cost. Like every medication, it comes at a cost. It often can cause some sexual dysfunction, some sweating. It's difficult to come off of these medications. I've been on a number of these things. So these things would be things like Celexa, Lexapro, Zoloft, Prozac. Did I say Prozac? (laughs) Paxil, Luvox, that kind of thing. That's the SSRI group. And the idea is that they maintain more serotonin, the neurotransmitter serotonin, in the gaps, the synapses of the brain, which serotonin is kind of like you're here and now, I'm content, I'm okay, chemical. And for me, I think it did help with my anxiety. And and the way I describe it is it takes my anxiety from like a seven, which is pretty unbearable, down to like a three or a four. It doesn't get rid of it completely, but it drops it considerably. But There's all sorts of side effects that I had from it. And I would find in my patients about 20% would have actually a really good response to the SSRIs. 
and their depression or their anxiety would decrease, they wouldn't have a whole lot of side effects, and it would really be a good medication for them. And I had those people on that medication sometimes for, for many years. And they didn't want to go off it either. Because that's the thing about medication is that it blunts our urgency to actually go after the root cause. So if you've got emotional, physical, sexual abuse as a child, you had great loss, you were abandoned, you know, rejected, bullied as a child, rather than going back to those issues and kind of bringing them up and trying to heal them, it's easier for most people to take a medication. Now, the fact is that the SSRI medications, in my opinion, work very well for about 20% of people. Another 20%, so leading up to about 40% in total, get some benefit from it. And after that, the kind of the benefits outweigh the risks a lot of the time. So there's a lot of side effects that are involved in it. They're also very difficult to come off of. Some are worse than others. And when I talk about the SNRIs in the next little segment here, those are really hard to come off of. SSRIs are hard to come off of. You get these brain zaps. I've had them myself. I've been on, I've probably been on five of the SSRIs over my anxiety career, as you might call it. And I stay on them somewhere between six months and a year, and then I just can't stand it. I can't stand the side effects. There's a lot of sexual dysfunction for a lot of people. One of my, one of my friends is a comedian and said, you know, if you thought you were depressed before antidepressants, wait till you can't have an orgasm. And I thought that was pretty funny. So it's understanding that these aren't without risk. The risks with the SSRIs and SNRIs that I'll talk about in a minute are quite low compared to some of the ones that I'll talk about in a few minutes. It's a very safe medication. Again, if you have three kids, you're going through a divorce and you've had a history of depression, you know, maybe you maybe you should take it. Maybe you should just take it so that you can you can function. And a lot of my patients did do that. They took the medication because it helped them function. They were going through a tough time, they were going through school. They needed something to help keep them semi balanced while they did it. So I'm not against medication. I think it's over over prescribed because medical doctors don't tend to have the training and trauma to be able to bring somebody through their trauma. So it's easier, as my uncle Colin says, to use the order of the rotating pen and write a prescription. Now, I'm not trying to slag on doctors because we are trained in a certain field and we're good at that field, but for mental emotional issues, it can be problematic especially when you're on antidepressant for a number of years. Trying to come off it is hard. But it really masks the underlying symptom. And really, if you, if you know my philosophy on this, is that this is a child in you that's creating your anxiety and depression. This is the wounded version of you. So if you throw a blanket over that child, yeah, you're going to sedate them, but you're not doing anything for the underlying cause. And none of these medications have actually healed anyone. They basically just numb you in a certain fashion so that you don't feel the pain as much. And sometimes the pain is what drives you to heal. And there is no growth without pain. <laughs> there is no growth without pain, especially if you've had you know, emotional trauma as a child. So that's kind of like the SSRIs. It, they, they do tend to work and about 20% of people fairly well, another 20% leading up to 40, not too bad. But in general, they're not a long-term solution because they, they really do numb you in general. And I had lots of people say, you know, I don't feel my depression anymore and I don't feel my anxiety anymore, but I don't feel much of anything. Now, the one field that they did seem to show some real promise in was OCD, because OCD is kind of an intense form of anxiety. And I would notice with people on SSRIs that they would often do quite well on if they had OCD. But as far as anxiety and depression, I'm not as convinced. So the next group that I will go to is the serotonin norepinephrine reuptic inhibitors, also called SNRIs. Now, they're another class of antidepressant that treat depression and anxiety, and they're not as effective in OCD as the SSRIs. It seems that way. Also, 
people seem to have a harder time coming off it. There's one called Effexor or Venlafaxine. And that seems, or Venlafaxine, it seems to be really difficult to come off Effexor. And there's a lot of horror stories about coming off brain zaps. You had to titrate the dose so low, just basically taking razor blades to kind of cut it down. So it can be really hard to come off of. Effexor seems to be one of the favorites for anxiety. It does seem to help anxiety maybe a little better than the SSRIs, but again, harder to come off of because it has this effect inside of us that for some reason our body really holds on to it. Another one is called Cymbalta, and sometimes these SNRIs are also used for chronic pain. They seem to interrupt the pain pathways as well. And pain and emotion, like if you look at the structures in the brain that, that modulate pain, a lot of them have overlap between physical and emotional pain. And there's, there was a study done that when people who had anxiety took Tylenol, which is not a very strong painkiller, they noticed a distinct drop in their symptoms compared to the group that didn't take Tylenol. So there is a very strong meshing between physical and mental pain because parts of the brain, they share parts of the brain. And I think this is, this is where neuroplastic pain comes in. Alan Gordon wrote this book called The Way Out. And it's how we teach ourselves to have pain. And I think the SNRIs, Cymbalta and Effexor, are, have some promise in treating chronic pain. But again, we're not getting to the root cause. And for some people, like we need it. They need it. We need to take it because it's the only thing that really provides them with any benefit. And if you look at sort of the background of anxiety, it's often people that had childhoods that had trauma and they couldn't get out of the trauma. And the other thing about chronic pain is that sometimes we don't find any symptoms of it. You know, people will say, I have Lyme disease, and it's very hard to see if someone really does have Lyme disease or doesn't have Lyme disease. Fibromyalgia. I've never seen a case of fibromyalgia in someone who didn't have childhood trauma. Same with irritable bowel syndrome. Never saw a case of irritable bowel syndrome in someone who didn't have childhood trauma. So it's important to understand what these medications do. Our eyes keep norepinephrine in the system a little longer, so they may act as a little bit better of an of a antidepressant because epinephrine can actually make anxiety a little bit worse. But again, it's really trial and error. A lot of these medications are just trial and error. And there was a genetic screen out for a while that said, hey, we might be able to tell you the best SSRI, the best SNRI that will help you. And most of the psychiatrists on this message board they're on said, it doesn't work. It doesn't. It's really just trial and error. Try one. If it works, stick with it. If it doesn't work, try another. And that's basically the medical profession's approach to these type of medications is just try to find one until one works. But again, you know, we're treating the, the chemicals behind it rather than treating the underlying dysfunction, which is usually a separation of the adult and the child. Now, I know for a medical doctor that gets a little woo, that gets a little out there, but really that's my point. And like sometimes the trauma, physical, emotional, sexual abuse as a child, it can be too much for people to overcome. Now, I'm saying that some of the new methods like the psychedelics, internal family systems, somatic experiencing, some of those therapies can be very helpful for people. But again, there's, there's traumas that are really difficult to overcome. And sometimes the only thing we can do is help you with some medication and, you know, use some therapy at the same time. So that's, that's that, that group. The next group is called the tricyclic antidepressants. And they're an older class of drug. And they, we prescribed tricyclic antidepressants in the 50s because we didn't have SSRIs or SNRIs because tricyclic antidepressants are lethal in overdose. And when Prozac came out in the late 80s, we had an antidepressant, we medical doctors had an antidepressant that worked, but if people took a handful of Prozac, they'd still be okay. You take a handful of amitriptyline or amipramine or nortriptyline, 
and it's going to cause some Q problems in your in your ECG. It's going to cause some ventricular dysrhythmias. It's going to cause some heart issues, and they're they're very lethal in overdose. So when the SSRIs came out, doctors felt a sigh of relief because the population you're you're prescribing this too, is generally depressed people, and depressed people have a much higher rate of suicide than non-depressed people. So it made us very nervous as doctors giving tricyclic antidepressants because they are so lethal in overdose. They do seem to help, you know, they block the, the, the absorption of serotonin and norepinephrine, and it does sort of keep those chemicals in the system a little bit longer, which may sort of brighten you up if you have anxiety and depression. Now, again, they can make anxiety worse because we're dealing with norepinephrine, which is basically adrenaline in the brain, which kind of wires us up a little bit. But in some people, it actually helps with anxiety. And this is the crapshoot that that frickin' medications are. And it's the trial and error. Like we find things over time that work. Now, my poor dad, nothing worked for him. Like he was on virtually all of these medications and they never really worked for him. So, you know, tricyclic antidepressants are an option these days. If you don't have a reaction to SSRI or SNRIs, TCAs are an option. And for some people, they do really help. The big side effect with that is dry mouth. Like a lot of people have this dry mouth and it's very hard for them to to deal with it. It also can sedate you a little bit, give you a bit of brain fog. So none of these medications are perfect. I think the SSRIs, SNRIs have probably lower side effects than the tricyclics, although that goes back and forth. And this again, folks, is my assessment of being a doctor myself for 22 years and prescribing these things and seeing what comes back, seeing how people tolerate it, how they don't. So the next group is benzodiazepines, which are vilified these days as horrible, horrible drugs. And you see people that's like, my doctor gave me Xanax and now I'm addicted and I'll never get off it. Well, yeah, doctors have to be very careful about using benzodiazepines because A, they are very effective and B, they are very addictive. And you have that when you have a very effective, very addictive combination in someone who suffered trauma when they were a child and will look towards anything for relief, benzodiazepines are a place that have a lot of dangers with them. So it is something that we have to be very careful about because they do work. I know people that will respond to one benzodiazepine. So these are basically Xanax, Alprazolam, Chlordiazepoxide, which is Librium, Diazepam, which is Valium, Lorazepam, which is Ativan. All these drugs are very powerful GABA agonists. So GABA is the, the, the inhibitory chemical in our brain, and GABA, it makes us feel good. We get when we take a, a shot of alcohol, we take a glass of wine, it's GABA. It, it goes to the GABA receptors and kind of gives us this feeling of well being. It's like, oh, this feels so, this, that, this, is why, this is why people drink, is for the GABA because it gives us kind of a Valium type reaction. But the problem is, over the course of 90 to 120 minutes, that those receptors get blocked by the alcohol and they don't start. They don't work well for us in just daily life. So we don't get that same calm feeling in daily life. So we need to take, this is why we take drinks and then people keep drinking to try and keep on top of that GABA response, but it declines over the course of time. So the more you drink, the you get a bit of a relaxation response, but it's less and less and less and less. So benzodiazepines are really powerful. They have risks for sure. It's, it's one of the medications that is probably the most effective. And the thing about the SSRIs, SNRIs, tricyclic antidepressants is they take two to six weeks to work. Now, benzodiazepines will work within an hour or so. And that's why they are so coveted by people who have addiction issues because they work. If you're in pain, if you had a, a childhood that was full of trauma and you take a benzodiazepine, that trauma is is weakened considerably, and that's highly addictive. So people who are addicted don't necessarily, and this is my opinion, don't necessarily do it because they want to get high. 
They just want to escape that pain. And what I try and teach is, okay, let's go and find that pain. Let's go and find that child. Let's show that child that they're seen, heard, protected, and loved. Let's show the child in you. Give them their own natural benzodiazepine, which is love. Now, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. I think one of the things about benzodiazepines, like Xanax and that kind of thing, and Ativan, is that they give you this sense of kind of peace and love, like you love things. It, it, it calms you down. It takes you out of that fight or flight reaction of your brain and says, oh, okay, I can be calm. And when you can be calm, you bring back your social engagement system so you can be loving, you can be calm and loving, which is one of the other reasons why when people take a drink and who are you know quite stiff and rigid, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I love you, man. Like, oh, you're so important to me because we've lit up those GABA receptors, those relaxation receptors in your brain. And when those relaxation receptors come up and our body feels calm, we can be our regular self, which is being connected, being loving. And going back to my own history, trusting my dad was difficult because he was warm, wonderful, playful, intelligent, great to be around when he was not psychotic or depressed or manic. So I learned that it's not safe to love him because when I do love him, eventually he's going to go psychotic or manic or depressed. And seeing him in so much pain wasn't worth it for me after a while, loving him and seeing him go through so much pain. So when we take these medications, I believe that they are so easy to become addicted to because they bring us back to a place where we can feel love, we can feel connection. And I think at the heart, addiction is basically a striving for love, a striving for connection that we won't allow ourselves to have because of fear. And our ego is in there. And I know I'm going off topic because this is talking about medications, but it's all really important. So when we take these medications, these acute medications like benzodiazepines or alcohol, and I put alcohol in a medication thing here, we feel this connection. We allow, we finally allow ourselves to feel this connection and love. And then as the drug wears off, we go back into our old alarmed self. And that alarmed self shuts off our social engagement system so that we don't feel as loving, we don't feel as connected. So this is one of the reasons why acute medications like benzodiazepines and alcohol have such a powerful effect on us because they bring us back to what I believe is our true nature, our true loving nature. They take away that feeling of love isn't safe and they kind of go, oh, okay, this is actually quite nice. This is actually quite safe to feel this loving, caring place in me. And then as those things wear off, we go back into our, our cage. We go back into our, our shell of protection. So life is about growth or protection. You choose on some level. A lot of it's chosen for you. So you can choose that life is about growth. And I'm just going to go outside of my, my comfort zone and be loving anyway. Or I'm going to stay within that comfort zone and only use medications or alcohol or whatever to allow me to be connected to myself and to others. So a little bit of a rant there. So those are the benzodiazepines. You know, some, some doctors will give you a benzodiazepine as you're washing in with an SSRI or an SNRI. And what a lot of doctors won't tell you is for the first two weeks that you take an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety agent, it can actually make your anxiety worse. And that's a well-known well known fact. Now, what I used to tell my patients is this can make your anxiety worse. And if it does, chances are we're operating in the right neurochemical system. So don't get too discouraged. In fact, it may be a sign that this is going to work for you. But it's already, by the time people see you and say, I need a medication, they're already, I don't know, at rock bottom. They're already really hurting with their anxiety or depression. So the thought that it's going to get worse is really painful. So I have to tell people, yes, this may help you in the longer term, but initially it's going to take two to six weeks to work and it could actually make your anxiety worse. So it's really un important to understand that if you're starting to take a new medication, you know, like an SSRI, an SNRI, it can get worse. Your anxiety can get worse. But 
I guess the silver lining in that, if there is one, is that it's probably acting in the right, in the right ballpark that will help you with it. So those are the main ones. There's other medications for anxiety like beta blockers. This is Indorol, Propranolol, Bisoprolol. And what they do is they shut off your body's response. They lower your heart rate. They, they lower your blood pressure. So the automatic reactions that you would normally get from anxiety, increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, that kind of thing is eased off and it reflects back into the brain because when your heart's going a mile a minute, it's very hard to think calmly and rationally. So beta blockers for some people seem to be very helpful. It seems to be very helpful for people with performance anxiety. So if you're going on stage as say a comedian or you're a musician and you get a, tre a tremor, sometimes beta blockers will help calm your anxiety and also allow you to focus. Now they can snow you a little bit too. So it's you know really finding that middle range. But for some people, beta blockers really help with their anxiety. But again, none of these medications is actually getting at the root cause of your anxiety, which for me is this wounded, traumatized, younger version of yourself that's still living inside of you. So none of these medications actually heal that, but they make your life a little bit easier to cope with. And one of my issues with the antidepressants was not so much when they, they didn't work, but when they did. Because a lot of times when people would feel better on their antidepressant, they wouldn't feel the need to go in and deal with their old wounds because they don't want to. And who, who does want to go back and visit that child who was ab abused, ban abandoned, bullied? We don't. We don't want to go back there. So the medication gives us a crutch in a way of not having to go back and deal with it. So again, double-edged sword. There's another one called Buspar or Busperone. Prescribed it a number of times, maybe one out of a hundred people it seemed to help. I know the Busperone pharmaceutical people won't like that, but it didn't seem very effective to me. It can cause some, some palpitations. It can cause some headaches. So it just, that was a medication that I would, you know, use as kind of a last resort and see if it helped, but most often it didn't. There's another group called the MAOIs, which are monoamine, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, Marplan, Nardil, Ensam, para, Pardil, what was it called? Parnate. Parnate. They can be very helpful for people, but you can't eat cheese, you can't eat anything with tyramine in it because they block a certain chemical and they block the enzyme that breaks down neurotransmitters. So they have a lot of complications to them. They're not widely used. Again, they're kind of like a, in the last resort category because it's just, it would be for someone who just didn't do well on any of the other medications. And again, medical doctors don't really know about other therapies. We're starting to get a little more versed in psychedelics and somatic therapies and internal family systems. So we're starting to get a little more versed in this stuff, but we still, our, our number one is to go to medication. That's just how we work. It's how we're trained. We're not trained in trauma. We're not trained to look for trauma. If we see something that presents as anxiety, depression, eating disorders, OCD, whatever, we treat it with, with a medication and then maybe refer you to psychiatry who will give you more medication. But it's, it's really important to understand that you have to take your own health into account too and not hand over all your power to a doctor or a naturopath or a chiropractor or anybody. It's really about, you know, my work is about empowering you to heal yourself. Now, we need help. We need a, we need a doctor to look after us, our physical stuff. We need all sorts of alternative health practitioners to help us. But when we feel that we have to depend on someone else for our own anxiety, depression, whatever relief, we're already in that sort of childhood powerless state that will just keep cycling on this same old illness. So it's really understanding that medications are a short-term strategy and they do work. I'm not against medication. Just know the side effects no, go in there with the intention that this is temporary. When I get past this breakup, this maybe death in the family, whatever, I'm going to make an intention to get off the medication and maybe look into somatic therapy or internal family systems therapy or maybe even psychedelics. 
but something that takes you off these medications on a regular basis because you really want to have the feeling like you're looking after yourself, you're loving yourself, you're connecting with yourself. And if you can do that, if you can really deeply connect with yourself, you won't need the medication. Now, again, there are some traumas that are so deep that that's maybe not true. But in general, for most people that I've seen over 30 years, if you can really connect with yourself, because much of anxiety and depression is just rejecting yourself. As I call jabs, you may have heard that on the podcast before, judgment, abandonment, blame, and shame of yourself. And while you keep doing that, you can't connect with yourself. So the medications become a coping mechanism that allow you to keep taking judgments, abandon, abandoning, blaming, and shaming yourself. They just allow you to keep doing that. I remember years ago, I had a, one of my buddies who's a, a stand-up comedian with me, and I gave him this, this acid blocker for his stomach because I had some samples of it in my, in my bag. Because every time he smoked, he would get this acid reflux. And what smoking does is it, is it paralyzes the, the top part of the stomach that normally closes itself off. So when he smoked, the stomach would relax, the acid would wash up, and he would get heartburn. And then this medication worked like a charm. So I cut out the acid in his stomach, and he asked me for more. And I said, well, let me get this straight. You want me to give you a medication so you can keep smoking? And he said, yeah. So... That's kind of a great metaphor for just medication is not the answer. It's a short-term solution. But the reason why people stay on it for a long time is they don't want to go back and heal that child. And I'm saying you can go back and heal that child. Most of us can go back and heal that child. And that's how you heal. Medications will help in the short term. But if you can give yourself love and pull out the blocks to loving yourself, stop judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming yourself, you won't need medication because you're needing the medication to allow you to keep smoking in a way. And that's what I mean. Allow you to keep jabbing yourself because that medication will allow you to sort of stay in the same level of understanding that you have. And you will keep judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming yourself. And the medication will kind of just offset that and allow you to tread water. What I want you to do is really learn how to connect with that younger version of you, yourself. See your alarm. Put your hand over it. Connect with it. Breathe into it. Find that younger version of yourself. See them. Hear them. Love them. Protect them. Show them that they are loved and cared for now in a way that they weren't back then. And if you can do that, you probably won't need medication. I got an email years back from one of my patients, and she said, Dr. Kennedy, I'm running out of my anti-anxiety medication and I need a refill on my perception. And I thought, wow, if she could really refill her perception, perhaps she wouldn't need the prescription. So that's what I said to her. I sent her a message back saying, you know what? If we could truly refill your perception, you wouldn't need the prescription. And I'll leave you with that. See you next time.